Um, good afternoon. You all who have joined us for SIA Share number 28. Um, as you know, <clears throat> it's an initiative of the SIA Practice Committee. And we are so pleased that each one of you was able to join us. We start the um, event on a sad note. Um, Ian Alexander passed away two weeks ago. He was a practitioner with vast experience and was totally dedicated to the profession in word and in deed. Uh, we pay homage to a friend, a colleague, a lecturer, and a Sayashe presenter. You will remember, um, it may even have been a year ago, um, that Ian shared his um, knowledge and experience with him, with us. My name is Eugene Barnard. Um, I trust you will enjoy another Friday afternoon in our company. Welcome to Corina Gibson from ECPD and to behind the scenes to Marlene van Nievenhuysen, who works tirelessly to promote Saya Share. Thank you and a warm welcome to Angelique Pillay um, uh, from our gracious sponsors once again, Durivit. Thank you for sponsoring the event, Angelique, and um, we encourage our attendees to support Durivit. Please participate in the event um, by posting questions and comments in the questions box during and um, after presentations. We do appreciate every comment that comes our way and we try to address as many as possible in the 10 minute Q&A session. In session two, Jonathan Noble will be sharing with us on what is design research and why it matters. And is it possible for us as normal practitioners to still do a PhD? Um, we look forward to Jonathan's presentation. But first, uh, for session one, we welcome AJ Corbett from the Eastern Cape. Um, AJ grew up in Durban and studied at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. He's from the practice TCH Architects and works at the coalface of the industry in the rural Eastern Cape. Um, AJ himself has successfully managed 650 diverse projects. Um, TCH has developed um, tailor-made software, uh, software and monitoring systems that offer weekly progress reports, uh, leveraging uh, real-time on-site data stored in an updated database. And um, AJ has generously offered to share, um, share their experience and in fact share their, their knowledge with us uh, and hopefully to the benefit of uh, all of you who have joined us. So well, um, AJ, I welcome you to the screen. Um, please switch uh, your um, camera on if you, if you can, just so that our uh, attendees can can see your face, and then you will come to switch it off again. Okay, there we are, AJ, over to you. Thank you all um, for this great opportunity. Uh, uh, welcome, welcome the opportunity to address all of you. And it's a topic I'm speaking about is project implementation methodology, which allows for a constant monitoring of progress over a number of sites with an up-to-date report. And uh, the and the rolling out of a number of projects simultaneously. Um, then, yeah, thank you. You've seen most and, and heard most of that, but a bit of background about myself. We're a medium-sized practice in the Transca. We've been in practice for over 30 years and have expanded our operations from Tata through to East London. So our focus mainly in the Eastern Cape. We've obviously worked on projects throughout the country, but not at any large scale. 
and the area of familiarity is the old Transkei region of the Eastern Cape. Um, we being centered in Mtata gives you a very different focus around what architecture we do and what architecture is available, you know, to be done. And we've been involved in a broad range of projects from residential through retail, commercial into government projects, dealing, dealing with health departments, education departments and others, sports, tourism, and then obviously municipalities and their planning and developments. So a broad range and never a dull moment. But today we're focusing on <clears throat> and presenting a methodology we've developed for monitoring of multiple projects which are rolled out simultaneously in the area. Um, as many of you would know, our region of the country is largely rural. Um, a lot of our sites are very remote and difficult to access, which leads to a range of individual projects for each one of them. So the methodology we've developed is a means of accurately reporting from the site visits and being able to record this in terms of progress schedule, which is comparable across a number of projects which would be Im implemented simultaneously. Um, the program we're going to focus on is the rollout of 49 schools, which is as per the title, it was over an accelerated program period of 12 months from inception to completion. And it involved the documentation and implementation of these schools on an accelerated program. We were fortunate to be invited into the consortium that consisted of both Design Space Africa, uh, led by Luanda Mpatwa, and Ruben Ready Architects in what has now become known as the CD or the Accelerated Schools Infrastructure Development Initiative, which is still rolling on. Um, we um, we were the lead consultants in terms of putting these projects onto the ground and getting them constructed. So today's focus is really not so much around the design, but rather about the methodology utilized to get these implemented. Um, to achieve this, we utilized a design system whereby we developed a kit of parts for each building typology that goes onto a school site so that we had prototype buildings for each element of a school and these were then applied across the program to, to suit the requirements of each and every individual site. Um, over the years, there's been a number of interventions with regards to standard plans and standard documentation and some of our fellow architects in this area would be familiar with the work of Sindili and Gonyama on the design manual and others. So we've reviewed a number of those and in this instance we developed the standard documentation for these schools which was done over a very constricted period and to get the schools out without delay. Um, the, the tenders themselves were put out, contractors were awarded and again there was a learning curve in this as well where some of the larger contractors were awarded a cluster of schools up to 12 and the largest one and the smaller contractors, smaller clusters down to individual schools. So in total we had 18 different companies involved and each one required monitoring at a different scale and, uh, and, and different contracts depending on their management approach. What we developed, and this is really a, an assessment tool for each site, there was a progress reporting matrix for each school and we allocated a weighting um, right the way across all aspects of, of each school as a weighted matrix which we then allocated to a progress percentage to each aspect. So all the way up from foundations through floor slab, wall plate level, windows, ceilings, roofing, <coughs> roof coverings, finishes, etc. These were individually tracked and we could give a percentage rating literally as it happens. Um, we had teams of inspectors that were conducting these on-site inspections and were able to report fortnightly on the exact progress of each school, of all 49 schools on a percentage basis and a final percent of the whole program. This means that as soon as the physical progress on a site slows down, you have an immediate response because you can see as soon as the project slows down and you can take steps to avoid that and bring it back onto program. This is so much different to the traditional way of doing it of monitoring Gantt charts and cash flows and things like that 
um, which are, have their place and are very necessary. But on a fast track program like this in remote areas, it's very critical to be able to to um, pick up any slow slowing down of progress on site. Um, this then was what we then did. We distilled that all down into a single page report, and this essentially reported on all 49 schools um, and the progress for each each contractor was then recorded. So, in doing that and in doing that across the board, we were able to report back on exactly what progress there was on the program over the past reporting period and what progress had happened in the period before because we recorded the two. So it gave us an, an immediate um, reconciliation of what physical progress was going on on site. And this is, to, this is the critical part of this process is that we are on site and monitoring it and within a two week period, we are confident on what we're reporting on. So it means that every uh, you've got a live uh, progress tracking monitor that tells you exactly where you are, and it allows the client to step in very early in the process to take action to sort out the issues. <clears throat> um, that again was teamed against uh, teamed with the full um, progress chart where we track the original contractor's path. The um, what you see there is the blue line, and then we track the the um, the cash flow. In other words, how much cash flow had been had drawn on the project, and in green we track the um, actual um, cash flow over that. So you can see that in some instances the actual progress was higher than the cash flow, and that meant that that contractor was in a very comfortable position. Whereas in others where the progress, the, the actual progress was below the actual cash flow, you could see that they would very soon run into, into problems. There's a lot more we can do with that. But having this information on your fingertips and being able to report back on it <clears throat> constantly is, is a critical part of, of being able to deal with it. That was then in turn, recorded in terms of a progress chart that charted all the progress right the way across the entire program. So if a contractor, and these are these are over the last three reporting periods, if a contractor ran behind, you can see he made normal steps here. But if contractors were flatlining, you had picked that up within a six week period and you knew exactly what was happening. Others, sorry, I crossed over it with that um, tag. But other contractors, when they make good progress, you pick it up fairly rapidly that they're making either constant or good progress. <clears throat> um, you can then take the option to, to monitor that going forwards and see exactly how it relates to your program and what can be done to, to rectify it. Also, you can look at um, whatever um, issues may be being experienced, such as weather or labor delays or things like that that would create that problem and it would often be reflected across all the contractors. So by, tra by tracking it on this basis, you, you can build up some norms very quickly. So, you know, this <clears throat> proved to be invaluable and introducing the level of management meant that we had a very well-informed client who became very involved in the process and was able to address the issues with the contractors as soon as they arose. This would be based on information which they had, which was in a verifiable format and given the remote, remoteness of all the sites, it wasn't necessary to physically go to the site to verify the information because it was already all contained in the report. The process means that, the architect, that as architects we are empowered to control the construction process and the progress that the contractors are making. Very often it's difficult for us to convince the client that there are issues on site when we don't have verifiable information on exactly what's going on and what's happening. And what this format allows us is an immediate response as to how to deal with the problems using a verifiable document that can show exactly what's going on on site. And the graphic you see there is an extract from our, um, our aerial reports we did where we 
we took aerial photographs of all the sites and we recorded that on a monthly basis. So you can see the prior month was here and this month was over here and our assessment of the progress on site is 63,6, which we would verify in terms of our of our tracking module we had for each each site. Um, and whilst it's very technical, all of this, it really serves to entrench and enforce our role as architects and as the lead consultants in the built environment, which means we can both monitor our projects on a day-to-day -day basis, but also be able to confidently report to the client what the issues are and what issues we are facing. All of this comes down to that fortnightly report, and in that report, each school is reported on together with the photographs, together with progress, with any of the issues that are arising. Um, I must stress that part of this is the systemization of the documentation, where we know that we're comparing like with like across the board. This is not a case of 49 different schools or projects with 49 different design resolutions that have their own individual problems, and it allows us to apply that typology across the project so that at all stages we're comparing like with like and gives us a very, very interesting record of progress across the entire project. You can see the outcome of some of these schools in the diagram that I've put up on the screen now. It's not a di uh, aerial photo, and it just shows how all of these, these schools develop to become their own little villages within the landscape. And just by comparison, the original school buildings all sit down here at the bottom of that slide. So, you know, that was the excitement that was generated, and that's why we were able to report as we went with that. Um, in, in that um, aerial survey, we, you know, we, we followed those through on, on a monthly basis, and there were schools and things that were obviously not without their difficulties. Um, we had a lot of problems with contractors. They ran into cash flow problems, management problems, and especially on this fast track program in remote areas, we had numerous failures of contractors. Um, more, I think, than about 40% of our sites resulted in termination of contractors and replacement by other contractors. But because of the monitoring and the accurate reporting, we were very easily able to take action against these contractors to ensure that the specific timelines and programs were met and we had a full set of documentation which could prove the issues that we were reporting on and resulted in the swift replacement of these contra contractors. Um, their replacement wasn't done out of hand as it would be a process which led up to that replacement as contractors were always given opportunities to remedy any of their failings and given the opportunity to sort out yeah, their issues and get back on track. If they failed to do this, obviously the outcome of that was then replacement. Um, the having you know the level of project oversight is is critical in the management of a contractor contract because it sits front and center in all decisions that are made. It allows other scenarios where you can quickly assess whether a contractor is going into an overpayment circ circumstance or where their cash flow exceeds the progress on site. And it's, it will more than likely lead to problems later on in the contract. So dealing with, the, with these things timeously, the tool becomes central and focal point, and that was really the purpose of my talk and discussion today, is to say that if we can control that progress and progress reporting, it puts us very much on top of the entire um, construction process. So if we can apply this level of contract management to the projects we run, we really cement our position in the implementation of the projects on today's site. It's often difficult for us to have a, have a say um, on what's going on on site and how things are progressing. But this physical tool which monitors the progress of contractors in actually constructing the building places that knowledge back in our hands. A lot of today's program assessment is an academic exercise led by Gantt charts, cash flows, and whilst they are relevant and shouldn't be replaced, this physical basis to progress reporting allows the opportunity to interact physically with what's going on on site. Um, 
these slides again are just showing some of the outcomes of this process and the product that was realized at the end of the day you know we really wanted um and what i really wanted to share was you know the images of the kinds of sites we're dealing with and how these are spread throughout the transcar region some of them are inaccessible when it rains and some of them are just practically inaccessible to anything more than a large pickup so they're not accessible to your big interlinked trucks and things like that which requires contractors to double sometimes triple handle material um, and uh, to get it ferried to site i've just got some graphics of the sites because you know as you know we do a lot more more thinking with our eyes than we do with what we hear and hear and read quite often um, and you can see that utilizing the kit of parts allowed us to be quite creative in the way we structured the spaces and of the buildings and in turn gave a hierarchical layout to the site and the spaces which are created within it which is part of the process we followed and resulted in some very lovely school spaces that are built in the most remote areas of the country in most of these instances, these schools are the biggest infrastructure project these remote communities will see in their lifetime. And, and even generations of, of people will go through that. And, and, you know, I'm pleased to say the entire project was rolled out over an 18 month period. 95% of the schools were handed over by this stage. And there were one or two problem schools which were both a problem with the contractors and problematic with regards to the site. In some instances, uh, we, we are forced to develop on sites that are very much less than optimum and result in massive earthworks, serious problematic soil conditions and accessibility issues. So they do become problems, but through this process of progress reporting, we're able to monitor them constantly and deal with the issues that arise as they arise. With that in mind, I thought it's an important lesson to share that through efficient planning and reporting, it's possible to manage large numbers of projects over a vast area simultaneously, providing you have a system to record this process and report on it accurately to the benefit of all concerned in the project. Um, we've brought the system to the broader knowledge of the architectural community really just as another tool in our arsenal as master builders and designers of projects that not only can create magnificent environments on paper but can also bring them into reality in a functional manner that answers the client's brief and the community's desire. Whilst this is a very technical document and a technical address, I think it has very real applications in the built environment because it really allows us to address the issue of constructing large infrastructure projects in very difficult conditions and getting them implemented successfully. This implementation has always been the Achilles heel of most infrastructure programs throughout the country, which is that implementation becomes so torturous that the product, when it's eventually completed, is a shadow of what it could have been if it were properly implemented and monitored through its construction. Um, this is where we as designers play an enormous role in creating the designs that can be efficiently built in areas like this and that give these, er these communities the kind of structures that they can be proud of. As I said, it's an enormous responsibility which is being placed in our hands and these 49 schools represent accommodation for some 20,000 pupils. Which is, which is what we're responsible for in this program. The least we can do is put this onto the ground in a manner and fashion that is a benefit both to the client and the communities and answers the client's brief because it also provides the community with an efficiently built structure that is properly completed and monitored all the way through to its final completion and handover. I hope I've been able to share something of importance here yeah, and more accurate way of monitoring progress because very often we just hand this over to program managers and gantt charts and it all becomes an administrative process and something that we don't really track we then just check that all the bricks and windows and things are put together properly and that they're installed correctly and you know we get down to the final snagging of these projects and hand it over eventually 
with this methodology, this allows us to become intimately involved with the construction progress process and to become the authority and on where and how our creations are built. Um, I, yeah, I'm really just in closing to say thank you very much for this opportunity. I appreciate it and I hope that I've inspired something here and hope that it will bring and help others that are dealing with these same kinds of issues on projects and programs and possibly introduce a more realistic monitoring of the construction process leading to the development of our designs. Thanks everyone very much for your time, appreciate it and obviously um, are able to answer questions, to handle answers, questions and answers. Thanks very much. Um, over to you, Eugene. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks very much, AJ. That's uh, an astounding achievement to have been able to roll those out in 18 months. That's uh, quite remarkable. Um, I have many questions of my own, but we're going to deal with the questions that uh, are coming in. Um, please do pose your questions um, to AJ. Right, from Clara Cruz Almeida. Um, comes a question, do you have a broad cost per square meter as an average out uh, of these projects for a bottom or top figure? Uh, AJ, I don't know whether that falls within the scope of, of your presentation, but do you? Uh, do you have figures um, on, um, on, on the costs? Yeah, the answer to that is this was completed in 2013, 2014. Um, okay. Okay. And in in that regards, those are very much outdated. I haven't updated them and mm -hmm. I haven't done that, but it's something that we do have in documentation and could escalate okay. through to current. Okay. Great, Lone uh, Paulson. Very interesting to see the variations achieved with a kit of parts assembled in response to the different site conditions through a courtyard typology, very different to the previous system of the same prototype plans rolled out in the past. Thanks for that comment, Loan. And then John um, Bizanos, uh, well done, AJ, on addressing difficult sites. Hi, John. Contract process and time constraints, refreshing to see that your team avoided the mundane provincial standard plans, the communities will surely appreciate it. John Littlefield, um, question for Mr. Corbett. As these schools were as built, uh, were all built in such remote areas, can the presenter advise whether these schools are all being utilized as hoped for? So, any um, subsequent visits to the site to monitor that, AJ? Yes, certainly. Um, we have done follow-up visits. Again, we have wanted to just track the success of the implementation and obviously any failings in the design and the learning process. So, we've been back to, to assess that. However, um, with regards to the use and usability, the majority of these are all full and functional. There were a couple of schools that were um, that have that have had experienced the loss of um, pupils, but on the on the majority of them, they're fully functional and occupied by by their personnel. And those um, one of there's there's two of the schools that are now being converted to special schools. Um, it, it, um, with with extensions to them to accommodate that. So the answer is it, it's it's a hit and miss. But generally, what you find in these areas is that when you build a new school, you get a lot more pupils than you would have expected mm -hmm. because the facilities are much better than any of the surrounding areas. Correct. Okay. Thanks. Um, Kevin Mitchell, uh, process is so important, particularly ones that provide the space for learning and engagement throughout. Great ethos, great work, well done, um, AJ. From Kevin and then Peniel Martin, well done, AJ. Um, AJ, just maybe a quick question from my side before we uh, 
sign off. Um, uh, first of all, the, you, you, you spoke about site visits, how many site visits and who actually inspects the work and how do you input the information? Is it input directly into a cell phone app or is it uh, into forms that then get translated into spreadsheets? So I'm going to try and keep it short, but that's a very long question. We had um, we had clocks of works that were responsible for between five and eight schools themselves, and they would visit at least once a week. But if a school was a problem school, they would be going two or three times a week. And those were clocks of works. We then had our technical team, which visited site every fortnight. And that was the full technical of engineer, quantity surveyor, and, and architects. And in turn, they would then verify and fill in those progress reports so that we could report mm -hmm. back on a percentage. So it's that percentage that gives you the incremental advancements over the weeks. That means you can, I, I can tell you even today at what stage a roof was put on on the ablution block on school number 23. I can tell you within about a week of the time that roof went on, I can still tell you, and that data is available. And that's the incredible power that that process gives you. Um, okay. We didn't have this down to a digital form, but we subsequently developed one whereby you can literally go on site with an iPad, you can fill in your percentages, and mm -hmm. those percentages update on your website immediately, and they're available literally right across the board. What we did do is we fed all of these figures into our website, and that was updated fortnightly. And anyone involved in this project from the Department of Education all the way through to the principals, if they were authorized, could access that to view the progress and the progress charts on it and the aerial photographs. So at any stage, anywhere, mm -hmm. everyone had digital access to this. So that is complete transparency of information. Mm -hmm. And okay. in fact, we've got to a system now where we can physically put up a website with a camera on site that is solar controlled that that uh, feeds a feeds a graphic onto a website that you can then access live what's happening on site on at any given moment um and okay, that that sure. system we've piloted we've done the research we've tried it it works and we yeah we would want to roll that out more in the future so okay, I think the, okay. This, so, the answer is that a yeah. digital interface is, is very easy. Yeah, okay. I'm just, uh, you know, obviously there might be um, <clears throat> attendees here who are facing similar challenges or have similar kinds of projects. Could they take the liberty of contacting you um, if they need some advice? And, you know, one doesn't know whether uh, you're going to make your software commercially available, but uh, at least mm -hmm. for some guidance? Um, but listen, absolutely. Um, because I think that the, and, and uh, you, you know, that the backbone of this whole thing is that, that single reporting sheet per school. And it's critical to get that right because you have a waiting for your earthworks, you have a waiting for each cluster of buildings. And, and once your waiting is right, you can see this thing runs like clockwork. Um, if you get it wrong, obviously you're going to be reporting on the wrong amount of progress and those sorts of things. So it's quite a delicate balance. But as soon as you fine tune that, you, you have a comparative tool that works right the way across all your sites. And any other, you know, it, it allows you to do that apples for apples comparisons. So by all means, yes. Is the That's a great AJ. Uh, on behalf of all our uh, attendees, uh, I have no doubt. I say thank you very, very much, and thank you for offering to assist where you can. Colleagues, uh, that takes us then to a short um, commercial. Um, Durivit are our sponsors, and they will be sharing a video with us. So let's just uh, give them a few moments to share their information, lovely products, and then we'll move on to the next presentation. Thanks. AJ. Thank you.
Any better sorry. Yes. Sorry. Colleagues, I'm terribly sorry. Thank you. Um, it's a privilege now uh, for me to introduce you to Professor uh, Jonathan Noble. Jonathan, if you'd like to switch your webcam on. And uh, for the second time in the history of SciShare, uh, you're back to the screen, Jonathan. Um, we're so pleased to see you. Um, Professor Noble is the academic head of, uh, archi of architecture at the University of the Free State. He lectures in creative research, architectural design, and convenes the PhD in architecture with specialization design program. This is uh, the first practice-based architectural research program in South Africa. Jonathan holds a five-year uh, BARC professional degree and an MARC by independent research, both from WITS and a PhD from the Bartlett School of Architecture, uh, University College London. Uh, Jonathan has authored the following two books, uh, uh, at least, uh, Africa, Identity in Post-Apartheid Public Architecture, White Skin Black Masks, and then secondly, The Architecture of Peter Rich, Conversations with Africa, and it was around that topic that uh, Jonathan lectured to us uh, previously. So Jonathan, um, once again, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward with anticipation to what you will be sharing with us. Over to you. Good afternoon. It is a real pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to you about design-based, practice-based research and why it matters. So as background, 
In 2018, the architecture department at the University of the Free State launched a new creative research program offering practice-based research degrees. By 2019, we had some 18 PhD candidates subscribed, many of whom are practicing professionals. The program is the first of its kind in South Africa and probably in Africa. And we are working with modes of study that are well established abroad and in collaboration with critics and academics from Australia, New Zealand, Namibia, and the United States. Architectural design is unquestionably a social practice. Yet oddly, questions of practice have not always been a locus for dedicated architectural research. In South Africa, postgraduate research has tended to focus upon has tended to focus upon architectural history and theory, urban studies, or conservation. Creative modes of inquiry that engage with the real world of architectural practice that aim to document, explain, and extend modes of practice have not held much sway. This lecture hopes to explain the essence of practice-based research in architecture, illustrated by work that is underway at the UFS. Let's start with this question. What is the nature of architectural practice? This is important because although qualitative design requires critical, reflective, and innovative practices, these traits are not always acknowledged to involve a form of research. So we need to start by appreciating the unique processes and forms of intelligence that motivate architectural design, especially with respect to connections between persons, environments, and things, about which I wrote, Crossing various economies, technologies, environments, scenarios, role players, and flows, architectural design creates new relations between things. Practice-based research allows for an inquiry into the intricate web of connections with a view to extracting the complex modes of thought and action that are required for success in design. It is a research that recognizes the intelligence and ingenuity of design. So to delve deeper into this, I wish to consider three key points which structure my talk this afternoon, namely the medium of architecture, then research in the medium of architecture, and finally designing a thesis. We might say that, that the medium of architecture, at least from the designer's point of view, consists of buildings together with various forms of representations, be they texts, scaled plans, models, or computer simulations that are required to understand, document, design, and create buildings. And what matters for the practice of architecture are the manifold steps and transitions that occur between people, intentions, buildings, and representations, and the complex layered processes that are involved in the practice of design. And I want to make three quick points about the nature of the architectural medium. It's a super object, it dissolves relations between the imagined and the real, and it is both an object and a process. Firstly, architecture is a super object because it exists in several parallel forms all at once. Initially, it is created and indeed exists as representations, but later it is performed. Construction is the performance of a building plan, and clearly the relation that exists between representation and performance is one of projection, where representations point towards construction. And this relation is two-sided with construction projecting back at design. And then once built, architecture takes on another form, namely a stage or backdrop for the cycles of life. The relationship between performance and stage is arguably less determinate and might be described as one of absorption and dissipation. Secondly, due to its projective character, architecture is a medium that sits between the imagined and the real. Indeed, it dissolves clear distinctions between these terrains. The architect imagines and draws something that does not yet exist. But once the drawing is performed, it translates into something that is absolutely material and real. I am reminded of René Magritte's provocative painting in praise of dialectics of 1936, 
which depicts a window in a building that looks into what appears to be an interior with a further building that features similar windows reappearing in the distance. Is this the representation of a real or an imagined building? A doll's house, perhaps, or the disconnected imagined sequence of a dream? One might interpret this work as dramatizing a slipping between reality and representation, the imagined and the real. And this is what architecture achieves. Thirdly, architecture is both object and process. Design is a process, a series of transformations that take an idea into a descriptive medium, drawing, modeling, simulating, which is itself subjected to a sequence of adaptations and transformations which ultimately project into the possibility of a built performance, which uh, requires a series of constructive processes. The drawings and models that propel the process are objects, as is the building that is constructed from the final plan. These architectural objects, however, represent stages within a process of creation, adaptation, transformation, connection, and concretization. Peter Downton's insights, drawn from many years of supervising creative research, are helpful for capturing the essential quality of design-based research. He makes a useful three-way distinction between researching about design, researching for design, and researching through design. Researching about design includes, includes much of the traditional scholarship by way of histories or theories of architecture. For example, theories that concern questions of architectural aesthetics or ethics. These are primarily studies about design. Research for design includes studies of how designers think with a view to framing recommendations for good practice or pedagogic theories which hope to clarify how we might teach in support of successful design practice as well as more technical studies regarding the tools that aid design, such as CAD, various forms of imaging, parametric, and simulation-based software. Research through design, however, looks to architectural design itself, its methods and means, with a view to framing the practice of the architect and harnessing this practice towards a mode of creative research. In this mode, the researcher is researching through the medium of design itself. It is design that does the research. Downton's three-way distinction helps to distinguish what might be called traditional research in architecture from design-based or practice-based research. With traditional research, we are mostly concerned with the study of and study for architecture. And the act of designing as such rarely forms part of the research process. With practice-based research, however, the intention is to lead with practice, to position the act of designing its processes and methods at the very center of the research endeavor, which is to mobilize the medium of design itself as the primary means for exploring and understanding design. And actually, is this not one of the oldest modes of research in architecture. Consider Andrea Palladio's four books of architecture. Palladio draws his, de his designs, he creates his drawings, and he publishes, this. he publishes them. He writes about them from both an aesthetic and a technical point of view, and discusses his mode of creation, his ideas of proportion, of harmony, and composition. Palladio's treatise is surely an example of practice-based research one that has had a significant impact on the history of architecture. Or consider Eugene villet leduc whose influence upon the development of architectural modernism is legendary. And how does villet leduc develop his ideas? He studies Gothic architecture. Importantly, he does not merely study it, he draws it. He uses architectural drawing to examine the rationality of building structure how forces flow from the vaulted roof to the ground, and how architectural detail celebrates this miraculous flow. He uses architectural drawing as his primary mode of research, 
which fits precisely into the notion of conducting research within the medium of architecture. I now wish to cite from work currently underway at UFS to illustrate how one might design a creative thesis. Cape Town-based architect Jonathan Jacobson is currently completing his PhD entitled Indefinite, the House as Living Landscape. This journey began, began with his practice-based master's thesis titled Ha, Papau, What, No, OK, Maybe, Improvisation in the Collaborative Archi Architect-Client Relationship, which was completed in 2019. In his master's, Jacobson examines the conceptual development of a single project, House 13, Kersner Estate, with a view to understanding his complex and often lengthy design process. He situates this study within what he calls a client-centered approach. More specifically, he studies in substantial detail the large number of sketches that were needed to develop a satisfactory design concept. He describes his process as a jazz-like improvisation that plays out between architect and client, and which is facilitated by an acceptance of uncertainty, open-endedness, delayed resolution, provisionality, and integration. He discovers that his final concept for the house is far more complex than he initially imagined it to be. It is richly layered, flexible, and resilient. A further insight was re related to the sequential nature of his sketches. Realizing this led Jacobson to explore what he calls archi-comics, a sequence of architectural sketches that build density of conceptual thought in a free-flowing, open-ended, and experimental way. The intention of the archi-comic is not merely to find resolution, but to expand conceptualization towards flexibility and what Jacobson calls concept resilience. In his PhD research, Jacobson now hopes to explore the mysteries and indefinite qualities of his built work, which appear to issue from the improvised and layered character of his design process. To this end, he has introduced a new mode of conceptual drawing, namely the koan. Koans may be described as conceptual drawn abstract abstractions that explore spatial, relational, or environmental ambiguities of various kind, kinds. Importantly, koans belong to design process. They possess exploratory and emergent qualities and are not merely intended as a representation of something. Jacobson's exploration of archi-comics and more recently koans is fundamental to his evolving research methodology. The point that wants to be drawn from this is that the sequential and ambiguous drawing was always an important aspect of Jacobson's process. He was doing this all along without fully realizing the crucial contribution that it made to his design process. Once framed and understood, this discovery has allowed for a new creative mode of architectural drawing via the archi-comic and the koan which he now uses to reflect upon and extend his design practice, and which clearly constitutes research through the medium of architecture. Now considering Jan Smith's PhD, entitled Mediating Landscape, the Power of Art in the Design Process. Jan and his wife Petra Smith are the principal of Smith Architects, situated in Bloemfontein. Their work, they work within a critical regionalist tradition and are clearly influenced by the architectural theories of Christian Norbrook Schultz, in particular his notion of genus loci. The Smith practice has a large body of work and the first step was to select the important projects and to establish timelines to define families of projects, points of transition and reoccurring themes, together with salient aspects of Smith's contribution to the design process. Upon presenting this, an important an aspect that stood out is the fact that Smith always starts his process with the site, often producing watercolor paintings of the surrounding landscape to tune his sensibility to the unique character of the place. 
Not too many architects do this, and Smith is indeed an accomplished watercolorist. Highlighting this act of painting raised the question as to what this might have contributed to his design process. Are there clear relations between his landscape paintings and his designs? And more importantly, could watercolor painting be used as a medium for research? Focusing on his landscape painting as a crucial element allowed Smith to identify gaps in his knowledge, which led to a further study of landscape painting, landscape art, and land art, which broadened his appreciation for what various artistic modes might contribute to architectural design. A major advance in the evolution of his thesis came from the idea that the work could perhaps be rearranged according to region, with a chapter dedicated to the study of each. This new approach allowed Smith to revisit the regions, to study the art and the visual culture that pertain to each, and importantly, to do further drawings and paintings of each area. Studying and making landscape art in each context not only facilitated a deeper understanding of what might have influenced his design process, but resulted in a renewal and transformation of his practice. A process is something that can be run forwards or backwards. It can be repeated, sped up, or slowed down. With Smith's PhD, it's almost as if he hit rewind on his creative process, playing it back again, revisiting the process, only now with the benefit of hindsight, renewed understanding, and a transformed mode of practice. His identification of a gap with respect to landscape art and land art was crucial for this, inviting him to re-enter his process through the practice of drawing and painting. The important point to note here is that the full significance of Smith's watercolor painting was not understood at the start of the thesis. The power of art in the design process, which features in the title of the thesis, was not something that was introduced, theorized about, or proposed at the start but instead it emerged from a journey of genuine self-discovery. In conclusion, the practice-based thesis uh, begins with practice. It uses modes of practice as its research tools, and at its conclusion, it returns to practice. As is the case at other international institutions where this mode of study is found, the completed PhD or master's at the UFS takes the form of a written and an illustrated document together with an exhibition of work. The exhibition is the final invitation to return to practice, for it is conceived as a creative challenge that allows the researcher to crown, to crown and conclude their study. The idea that a PhD might be concluded through an act of creativity is perhaps a novel one but it is entirely consistent with the primary aim of this mode of research, which is that of self-discovery and the transformation of practice. Creative research in architecture. What is it and what can it do for you? To answer, this is an opportunity to reflect upon your practice, to capture and curate the true essence of your work, and finally to open a new creative challenge that might propel your design creativity into a transformed and rejuvenated future. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> Jonathan, once again, thank you very much for a thought-provoking and delightful presentation. Um, I do invite questions and comments um, uh, right let's say loan paulson um aj this sounds like a good topic for a phd um Gerard Bosman, great presentation jono clara cruz almeida great and clear presentation and um, 
Look, uh, in a sense, you've answered the question, Jonathan, that I was going to ask, uh, but maybe just to reflect on what you've said. Um, the message to practitioners, I mean, we're sitting here with over 300 uh, practitioners, many of them, I suspect, uh, sit with a body of work uh, of years of experience. And um, what would your message be to, to, to our attendees regarding their own work? And um, even if they don't register for a PhD, how, um, how should they approach the archive of, of, of uh, years and sometimes decades of um, hard work? Look, I must say, um, when I first encountered uh, practice-based research, which is really a big thing abroad um, and never took on in South Africa until now, I, I was actually skeptical that practitioners would want to write about their work, but I was proved very wrong on that. And I think that a lot of uh, practicing architects get to a point where they have a body of work. And you know, when you work as an architect, um, well, you make money, okay, that's great. But you, you're doing it for other people. <laughs> you're designing your buildings for other people. And, 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 and the pressures of practice are that you sketch and you draw and you just keep on going. You, you don't have a chance to really collate, um, curate, step back, understand, capture. You know, so what this uh, what 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 this modality of study does, it, it gives creative people the opportunity to step back from their body of work and to, you know, really curate it and capture it and represent it in a book, and go deep, very deep, into the thinking that underlies their work and the processes that are evolved, because you know the most some of the most innovative creative moves are made in the line of battle in architecture they're not they're not concepts you're going to read in books okay they're not concepts you learned at archi school they, they're invented in the moment and this mode of research helps us to capture those to write about them theorize about them and share them make them public and build an archive uh, which is dedicated in our case to south african architecture so yeah, that's. I think that's what it's. That's what it's about. Yes, yes, quite. No, Jonathan, thank you, and thank you for uh, the comment. Uh, the comments that are coming through. Shamulo um, Ngubeni, great presentation. Thank you for the insight, and then Loan Paulson again. Well done on getting this program established in South Africa, Jonathan, it will definitely provide a valuable archive of some very exciting work and many different modes of practice and long last the value of design can be appreciated. Um, Heather, one of our previous presentation, uh, presenters as well, it would be great if practice-based research in South Africa could result in a series of publications that foreground the innovative work done here. Yeah. Thanks, um, Heather, for that. And Elizabeth van der Pfeiffer, great presentation as always. Elizabeth, thank you so much for that comment. Tukile uh, and Yezi for professionals at the beginning of their journeys. How could this outlook benefit processes to come, Jonathan? Yes, I really appreciate that question. And I didn't put it into my talk because 20 minutes, I just decided to focus on the, the key bit. But, but that's a very important question. And the, the simple answer to it is that there are at least two ways to do practice-based research. Okay, so the one way, which was the one that dominated in my talk, is, is it's really talking about experienced architects with a large body of work. And those uh, practitioners Bring their work into the PhD. We acknowledge that it's 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 their authorship and it's their originality, and they study what they they primarily study what they've done in the past. So that's the one way. The other way of doing it, which is absolutely and equally valid and equally fruitful, is for a younger practitioner to come in and say, "I want to explore something new." So so that 
one proposes a set of, if you like, design challenges that then get explored. Uh, and they have to be challenges that can lead to reading and research and experimentation. It's almost like design as a set of experiments don't have to result in specific buildings. And then we, we write about that and turn it into a PhD. So for instance, we, we just had a PhD exam, Marie Herbst, she did a beautiful thesis on abstract painting and architecture. And her question was, well, you know, there's lots of architects who've done paintings. We know that Le Corbusier was painting and there are quite a few, uh, Alva Alto used to paint and so on. Her thing was, I love painting. I want to do paintings. What can abstraction give to the design process? And so she staged a series of ab ab art abstraction and architectural design experiments, okay, and wrote about it. And my gosh, it's an extraordinary text. It really is. Um, so that's just a for instance of what you can do as a young, a young person. Yeah. Okay, Jonathan, we uh, are just about to conclude, but I need to just uh, take a the last few comments that have come through. Arthur Barker, your colleague, uh, how would you suggest a way to avoid subjectivity in an, in an analysis of your own or one's own work? Okay, that's also a very important question. And the simple answer there is we don't. Okay, so I think we've got to distinguish between mere subjectivity, which is just saying, oh, I did this because I did this because it's great. Mm. That doesn't cut it for a PhD. We all agree on that. Mm. Um, we are absolutely dealing with subjectivity, but the point is the transformation in the practice and the discovery and the growth. So mm -hmm. it's not merely the eye that says this, but it's the rejuvenated eye that comes out of the process with an expanded understanding of who I am, what I do, and what I'm capable of. And it's that discovery, which frankly is very objective, even though it's totally framed within a subjective process. So for us, mm -hmm. the discovery is critical to making it a valid study. The other thing is we are representing it. So we are creating an archive. Correct. Okay, Jonathan, thanks for that comment. DT Jivan, uh, inspirational. Thank you, Jonathan. Mercy Mawehe uh, says, great presentation. Thank you. Steve Archer, thank you for an interesting, entertaining afternoon. Peniel Martin, great presentation, Jonathan. Elizabeth for the Pfeiffer again. Where can we get Jonathan Jacobson's? Jacob's master thesis. I have looked at it for it online, but it is not on the UFS portal. Jonathan, a quick answer. Um, it should be on the portal. Why it's not on the portal, I don't know. I'll, I'll definitely take a look at that. <laughs> um, it's supposed to be there. I think that must be a blips. Mm. Or, you know, universities can be slow. It could be that they just mm. didn't upload it yet. I'll actually take a look okay. at that. But um, I'm sure that if you contact John um, and his, his emails on his website, I'm, I'm sure he would be delighted to share it with you. Knowledge is knowledge and the thesis is in the public domain. There's nothing that we would want to hide here. Uh, we are obviously committed to sharing. I'm sure he would gladly send it to you. Great. Uh, Nicola Vessels, thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. Lovely to see my watercolor brought from Jan, bought from Jan. His gift is phenomenal as an artist. Michael Hart, thanks Jonathan, inspirational. Discovering underlying ideas to past work makes total sense for future projects. Zekile again, thank you so much. Nikhil Joshi, fantastic question and it it is wonderful to see how the program accommodates for young architects. Okay, I'm not going to read all of it. Thank you, Nikhil. Elizabeth Yolanda again, thanks. Uh, Christo Heckert, architecture is indeed inventive. Thanks again. And that concludes it. Jonathan, uh, thank you so much.
um, colleagues, we can end um, it there. I thank you, uh, Jonathan, on your behalf. Um, and then just before you leave, can uh, allow me to uh, just say a few concluding words again to our presenters. Thank you so much. Um, we come to the end now of um, Sire Share number 28. Thanks again to our gracious sponsors, Durivit, uh, for your uh, kind sponsorship this afternoon. Then, um, as already mentioned, SciShare carries a category one CPD value of 0.1. Uh, we invite you to join us again on the first Friday of November, that's the 3rd of November, when we will host another two professional present, professionals as presenters, and they have much to share. Um, Uwe Putlitz, uh, his retired CEO of JBCC, I spoke to Uwe and questioned him on, him, him on what he thinks architects need to, uh, to be reminded of. So he will be addressing amongst others, the challenge to equip the architect in his role as principal agent. And then delightful Bram de Villiers from Earthworld Architects will be inspiring us with Earthworld magic. So we do look forward to that and we hope that you will be able to join us uh, next week. I'm going to end with just a, a short quote from, uh, from my favorite artist, Charlie Mackesy. Um, he prepared a sketch and when I had a good look at the sketch, I realized it de depicts a universal truth, one that applies equally well to our lives but also to architecture, the architecture we produce. Isn't it odd? We can only see the outside, but nearly everything happens on the inside. So with that thought, I leave you. Thank you for joining us and have a lovely weekend. See you on the 3rd of November. Bye-bye.